Hello students, today we'll be doing the current affairs of uh, the 2nd of March and so on. The first topic that we'll be discussing is digital lending. Then we'll talk about the SWIFT ban. Why is it such a big issue? And then we'll talk about uh, Samarth Ramdas, who uh, the governor of Maharashtra held was the guru of uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji. And then we'll be ending it with PM Gati Shakti. This is the most important topic. Along with it, uh, this has been there in the news uh, for a lot of reasons. So even digital lending shall be spoken about in detail. Now, first topic, digital lending and issues associated with it. The reason why it is in the news is because the Reserve Bank of India recently cancelled a certificate of registration issued to PC Financial Services Limited. This is a particular organization which had digital lending certificate, which was primarily engaged in mobile app based lending operations through an app called Cashbean. Now, the reason why it was cancelled is because the RBI said that the certificate of registration of the company has been cancelled on account of some concerns such as gross violations of RBI directions on outsourcing and knowing your customer norms. What if the important details or the data of the customers is being leaked to someone else in an unauthorized manner? So the KYC norms, know your customer norms are often maintained by the banks in order to prevent money laundering from happening. It's not for banks to sell this data to someone else or use it in a in a negative manner, it is not for that. The company was also found to be charging usurious rates of interest, extremely high rates of interest and other charges to its borrowers in an opaque manner. Charging any amount of interest rates is also not uh, uh, possible under the uh, licensed banks. This charging very high usurious rates was happening usually under money lenders. And hence, in order to ensure that there is a more favorable uh, interest regime, uh, the government had created the Reserve Bank of India. It had created scheduled commercial banks. It had created regional rural banks in order to provide proper and regulated interest rates. Despite all of this, uh, this uh, particular uh, PC financial services was charging you serious rates. It was also indulging in unauthorized use of logos of the RBI and Central Bureau of Investigation for recovery from borrowers in gross violation of the fair practices in order to threaten the borrowers to pay it was using all these means which are not authorized and which are illegal now what is digital lending first of all you have to understand that digital lending consists of lending through web platforms or web apps web apps by taking advantage of technology for authentication and for credit assessment. Now they will take your crystal rating or they will take your uh, you know the ability to pay money. This is known as the crystal rating. Each person would have a crystal rating. So based on that rating these web platforms and web apps they will charge you a particular interest rates if interest rate if your crystal rating is good then they'll charge you lesser interest rate if your crystal rating is bad then they'll charge you more interest rates so based on that particular technology and credit assessment they will use web platforms and web apps in order to lend money and corner you now india's digital lending market has seen a significant rise over the years now, the digital lending value has increased from around US 30, $33 billion in 2015 to around $150 billion in financial year 2020. It is to be known that this digital lending, it has increased tremendously over the last couple of years. As much as in financial year 2015, there was hardly $33 billion lending that was happening which has increased to around 150 billion dollars in financial year 2020 which is huge now now uh, it has a lot of advantages it also has a lot of disadvantages advantages being that it causes financial inclusion 
and it also reduces borrowing from informal channels such as money lenders and all it increases you know time saving you can instantly avail a loan according to most of these advertisements which are given by these digital lending platforms they say you can instantly get a loan no matter what if your credit rating is bad then higher interest rates but instant loans so it helps in financial inclusion it saves time it uh, reduces borrowing from informal channels okay but however now there are big problems again now again because you can see that even in the case of this pc financial services there was high interest rate and illegal methods of getting back the money was used illegal ways of getting back the money was used and hence that becomes a problem okay you can't use it okay next rbi panel recommendations the reserve bank of india working group on digital lending including lending through online platforms and mobile apps submitted a recommendation in 2021 this rbi working group what were the recommendations that it submitted on digital lending a separate legislation should be enacted to oversee digital lending set up a nodal agency to vet digital lending apps if you remember recently there were some of these apps which were chinese controlled and which were lending money at very high interest rates and which were using unauthorized means of extracting money back a self regulatory organization should be set up for participants in the digital lending ecosystem develop certain baseline technology standards and compliance with these standards as a precondition for offering digital lending solutions okay disbursement of loans should be made directly into the bank accounts of borrowers and servicing of loans should be done only through the bank accounts and not through liquid cash so that you know the regulatory entity can keep a tab on how much money is coming how much interest is being paid okay all data collection must require the prior consent of borrowers and come with verifiable audit trails and the data itself ought to be stored locally so that data cannot be misused now what are the issues of digital lending apps like what we spoke they attract borrowers with the promise of quick loans however excessive rates of interest and additional hidden charges are demanded from borrowers it is very opaque and once the borrower steps into it there is higher interest rates which are charged such platforms adopt unacceptable and high handed recovery methods they misuse agreements to access data on the mobile phones of the borrowers and this will be a problem because uh, you know there is no one to regulate these digital lending uh, apps currently you know it's not possible for the rbi to keep regulating these digital lending uh, apps and hence even the rbi working group has held that there should be a separate legislation and a separate regulator which control digital lending okay now moving on swift code the west unleashes swift ban on russia okay what is swift code okay in order to send money from one country to an other country you need a swift code now the swift code is not needed when you are sending money domestically in the case of domestic sending all that you need is an ifsc code in order to locate where you are sending and verify the person however in the case of uh, inter country sending of money then you would need a swift code in order to verify to whom you are sending money and if the money is being sent to him or not properly okay uh okay next russia was cut off from the global payments system in retaliation for invasion of ukraine now the assets of russia central bank are also to be frozen constraining moscow's ability to access its overseas reserves prior to this only one country had been cut off from swift transactions which was iran it resulted in it losing a third of its foreign trade 
Why? Because if you can't have transactions between countries, then you cannot have foreign trade. The move against Russia is only par partly implemented for now, with only some Russian banks being covered. It is not complete SWIFT ban, but only SWIFT ban which uh, comprises of some Russian banks. The option of expanding it further to pan country ban is something that the US and its allies are holding back as a further escalatory move. These are expected to badly hit a country that is heavily reliant on the SWIFT platform for its natural resources trade, especially for oil and gas exports. What is SWIFT? Now, it's more important to understand what SWIFT is rather than uh, what has currently happened even. Now, SWIFT stands for Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication and it's a secure platform for financial institutions like banks to exchange information about money transactions. Uh, only when banks actually send SWIFT codes, they use SWIFT codes to show that this is a secure transaction. This SWIFT code is necessary for authentication of transactions. While SWIFT does not actually move the money, it operates as a middleman to verify information of the transactions. By providing secure financial messaging service to more than 11,000 banks in over 200 countries. So it is not SWIFT that actually moves the money. Okay. But SWIFT is only a authenticating entity which works as a which works as a proving entity between so many 11, between 11,000 banks. Only using that SWIFT medium is the authentic authenticity of the transaction verified. Based in Belgium, it is overseen by central banks from 11 industrial countries, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, Sweden, Switzerland, United Kingdom and the United States besides Belgium. Its headquarters is in Belgium. Now, SWIFT code is used when transfer happens between two banks internationally as we use IFSC codes for domestic transfers, finance for uh, domestic transactions within the geographical territory of India. Say for example, a customer of Bank of America or New York branch wants to send money to ICICI bank, bank account in Bangalore. He can approach the Bank of America's New York branch and with the account number of the ICICI bank to which the money needs to be deposited and that ICICI bank's SWIFT code for the Bangalore branch. Hence it is SWIFT which ensures that this particular transaction has not been breached and that it is secure. Bank of America's New York branch will send the payment message to ICICI Bangalore branch over the SWIFT network. Once the ICICI bank's Bangalore branch receives the SWIFT message, about the incoming payment, it will clear and credit the money to the account. Only if it is coming through this SWIFT server, will it be a proof that the transaction is secure and that it has not been tampered with. Okay. Now, uh, it is to be known that, it is to be uh, known that, uh, yeah, according to the White House, it has actually said that uh, the SWIFT ban will make Russia rely on telephone or a fax machine to make payments, which is impossible to conduct foreign trade and hence foreign trade is bound to get affected. And Russia, as you know, it's a key exporter of crude oil. Uh, and uh, natural gas, which is one of the reasons why the crude oil prices have been increasing because they believe that Russia cannot sell uh, 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 crude oil from now on. Okay. Now, it is also to be noted that uh, earlier SWIFT uh, banks were also in the news because of that uh, PNB fraud, uh, which involved uh, Mr. Nirav Modi. Okay. Uh, 
it's actually a cooperative and it is owned by the central banks of all these countries that we spoke of the 15 industrial countries okay next samarth ramdas recently the maharashtra governor claimed that Maha, uh, samarth ramdas was the guru of chhatrapati shivaji maharaj now this is a very controversial topic because uh, there have been debates about uh, if he was the guru of chhatrapati Shiva, uh, shivaji maharaj or not it is to be remembered that he was uh, born in 1608 which means that he was alive in the 17th century and he was a contemporary of bhakta tukaram he was also existing in the later part of you know uh, he was also there in the later part of 16th century and the early part of 17th century. So they were contemporaries. These questions can be asked as uh, prelims bits. His literary works include Karunashtake, Dashaboda, Yuddha Khanda, Sundara Khanda. Dashaboda actually contains the political philosophy of Samarth Ramdas. He built, uh, okay. First of all, it is to be remembered that Samarth Ramdas was not a pacifist like the other Bhakti saints. His writings include strong expressions encouraging nationalism to counter Muslim invaders. He built Hanuman temples and he asked the youth to value exercise. Okay, So he was not a pacifist. And uh, also while uh, he believed in uh, nationalism. While uh, okay, saints from Maharashtra are usually classified into Varkari and Darkari. So Samarth Ramdas was belonging to Darkari school. He emphasized the warrior's position in society and he built numerous study centers also throughout the country. He also recognized women's roles in harmonious society and he promoted women into positions of power and encouraged them to participate in religious work. He had a lot of women followers. Some of them are Venna Bai, Akka Bai, etc. Okay. Now, Ramdas was a devotee of Madhavacharya and his Dvaita philosophy. Now, please, I hope you know the different philosophies that exist. Advaita, Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita, Shuddha Dvaita. Okay, Advaita was primarily spoken of by Shankara Charya. While Visishta Advaita was spoken of by Ramanuja Charya. While Dvaita was spoken of by Madhava Charya. And Shuddha Advaita was given by Vallabha Charya. Please know the differences between all these different uh, schools of philosophy. Advaita, what it believes in? Dvaita believes that uh, Dvaita believes that uh, the independent soul and the supreme soul are two different entities, and one can never be a part of the other. Also, Samarth Ramdas, he who did not believe in these caste and creed distinctions. He was an outspoken supporter of eradication of caste. He served as an inspiration for several Indian thinkers and freedom fighters later on, including Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Hedgevar, Ramchandra Ranade, etc. Now, moving on, the most important topic for the day is PM Gati Shakti. Now, what is PM Gati Shakti? PM Gati Shakti is nothing but uh, Indian infrastructure, physical infrastructure, as you know, is not up to the mark as compared to in the US or in Europe. In these countries, logistics costs are only around 8% or 6% of the nation's GDP. While in the case of India, logistics costs are around 14% of GDP. And in order to reduce this excessive spending on logistics, why? What is the problem? If there is excessive spending on logistics, then the end product is also very expensive. And if the end of product is expensive, the demand falls. And if the demand falls, 
more number of people won't produce it which means that slowly growth will fall will reduce the competitiveness of indian produce indian exports will fall and that is a big problem so what are the benefits of this gati shakti plan what is envisioned roadways capacity is to be increased uh, railway railways transport cargo capacity to be increased to 1600 tons by 2025 renewable capacity to be increased to 225 gigawatts by financial year 2025 Uh, it is to be again remembered that india has targets to achieve by 2030 of around 500 gigawatts of renewable energy uh, as according to the cop uh, promises made in glasgow by prime minister recently at a un fccc summit around 200 new airports and heliports and water air road roams are envisioned transmission network to be increased to 450000 uh, kilometers 4g connectivity for all villages around 20 new mega food parks so so much of infrastructural projects are planned prime minister modi called on the private sector to partner with the government in infrastructure development under the pm gati shakti plan aimed at coordinated development of infrastructure with a view to lower logistics cost in order to compete with the developed countries this is the end goal he also encourage the private sector to use data available on the gati shakti portal there will also be a portal that will be developed called the gati shakti portal which offers around 400 layers of geospatial data including information on existing and planned infrastructure forest land industrial estates in order to better plan out infrastructure projects which are being built so he wants the private sector to use this portal gati shakti portal which contains most of the data so that there is no redundant infrastructure being constructed so private sector should be a better part of this development of infrastructure in india now what is the pm gati shakti it is nothing but a national master plan for multimodal connectivity what is multimodal connectivity it means that say for example uh multimodal connectivity means usage of multiple modes of connectivity uh say for example if at all from varanasi i want to transport uh, an item to calcutta kolkata now it is not enough if at all i have only one road okay because what if i am uh, till uh, varanasi what if i have inland waterways and from varanasi there is only road uh, connectivity to kolkata that is not advisable right so it is always important to have multiple modes of connectivity there is also need to have inland connectivity from varanasi there is also need to have uh, road connectivity or railway connectivity so there should be different modes of connectivity at these hubs in order to use any particular mode of connectivity as we need so you develop certain hubs and from these hubs you have multimodal connectivity using any mode of transport it aims at coordinated planning and execution of infrastructure projects to bring down logistics cost the gati shakti scheme will subsume the 110 lakh crore national infrastructural pipeline that was launched in 2019 besides cutting logistics cost the scheme is also aimed at increasing cargo handling capacity reducing the turnaround time at ports to boost trade it also aims to have 11 industrial corridors and two new defense corridors one in tamil nadu and the other one in uttar pradesh 11 ics and two defense corridors it aims at extending 4g connectivity to all villages like what we spoke earlier it aims at adding 17000 kilometers to the gas pipeline network to increase usage of natural gas which is lesser polluting also it will help in fulfilling the ambitious targets set by the government for 2024-25 including expanding the length of national highway network to 2 lakh kilometers creation of more than 200 new aer- airports heliports and water aerodromes like what we spoke 
and then it takes an integrated approach it intends to bring together 16 infrastructure related ministries this will help in removing long standing issues such as disjointed planning lack of standardization problem with clearances and timely creation and utilization of infrastructure capacities now when you bring in all these ministries on that one portal called gati shakti it will remove redundant building of infrastructure or if at all there is a uh, pipeline that is built for gas now what if the uh, ministry of water decides to dig up that particular road itself and it harms or it wants to then af just after one month it digs out that pipeline that has been built for gas that doesn't make any sense hence to avoid these uh, repetitive tasks there is a need to integrate the working of these ministries especially in infrastructure and hence uh, it will be involving these 16 infrastructure related ministries so that there is jointed planning and there is a clearances problem which gets solved when there are uh, clearances which are pending from one department with another department uh, that will help in solving all of this also it involves the creation of a common umbrella platform called Gati Shakti digital platform through which infrastructure projects can be planned and implemented in an efficacious manner by way of coordination between various ministries departments on a real time basis now it's actually this will uh, it it also allows the government departments to track in real time and at one centralized place the progress of various projects see the government doesn't need to go to different different places to track different different projects it ensures that there is real time tracking it is done all in real time and there is centralized tracking ah okay also a project monitoring group monitoring group under under the department of promotion of industry and internal trade dp iit under ministry of commerce what is this uh, this department under it is under the ministry of commerce this will be monitoring the status of projects in real time basis so this is this can be called as the monitoring uh, department it is the uh, department which is the nodal department for execution of projects on infrastructure mm. that's it for the day